I am Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, it's a done deal at last. Mayor Bob Filner signs off on a much-debated contract. San Diego's Water Authority says it's racked up a win in its fight over wholesale water rates. We'll explain. And we'll show you how one restaurant in Normal Heights is making a big difference in the lives of people living with HIV and AIDS. And some San Diego lawyers will take a hike that is a 600-mile trek to Sacramento. Why it may be the final step in getting a dozen convictions overturned. Plus, somebody's watching you and it could very well be your employer. Why it's legal to track your every move on a computer, cell phone and company car even when you're out of the office. I'm Peggy Pico with an in-depth look at those stories just ahead. Also. Also tonight, we'll give you a look at a North County production trying to redefine community theater. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. After a long battle, San Diego Mayor Bob Filner has signed an agreement with the Tourism Marketing District. The agency will now get funds for marketing the city as a tourist destination. The TMD uses a 2% char charge on hotel room rates. The trouble was some pending lawsuits over the funding method. The suits claim it's an illegal tax. Filner says the original TMD contract didn't protect the city. If a judge ruled against the charge, he refused to sign until he got a new deal with a better protection for the city. Tourism officials say San Diego is losing out on convention bookings because of uncertainty about expanding the downtown convention center. State Coastal Commission still has to sign off on the project, but the matter has been pushed back. Two groups have already canceled plans to come here. The Tourism Authority says final approval of the expansion will bring meeting planners back. San Diego water managers say a judge has handed them a victory in their battle over rising water rates. He's told the region's largest wholesaler to explain its rates. San Diego's Water Authority sued the Metropolitan Water District, or MT MWD, over its prices for water. Officials say they asked MWD to explain its rates but never got an answer. The judge uh, has given the agency until May 10th to respond. A female Marine who said she was raped will get a letter of reprimand and lose $3,000 in pay for lying to investigators. Prosecutors say the woman's husband had filed an adultery complaint against her. They say she claimed rape in an attempt to avoid the adultery charge. A court-martial convicted her of attempted adultery and obstructing justice. Officials in New York say Times Square was a planned target for the suspects in the Boston Marathon bombings. They say the surviving suspect told investigators he and his brother made a spontaneous decision to go to New York with a pressure cooker bomb and five pipe bombs. But Jokar Sarnayev has stopped talking to authorities since being read his Miranda rights. A memorial today in Texas for the victims of last week's fertilizer plant explosion. Fourteen people died. Ten of them were first responders. The governor of Texas was joined by President Obama, who told mourners their community is not alone. President George. And earlier today, Obama joined his four living predecessors for dedication of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. Politics were set aside for the day. The former president was praised by his Democratic peers and by his father, PBS NewsHour will have more on the new presidential library at 7 o'clock. State fire officials are warning of an extremely dangerous fire season after a dry winter. Even on an overcast day, high fire danger is being tracked in our mountain areas, shown in yellow on this map. Across the state, fire crews have been called to more than 680 wildfires this year, about 200 more than average for this time. San Diego firefighters have some new tools to help pets caught in wildfires. They're specifically designed oxygen masks. They fit like muzzles right over a pet's face. About 40,000 pets are killed in fires every year, and most die from a lack of oxygen. We understand that the pet is part of the family. So when we rescue a pet, 
the family gets just as excited if we were to uh, rescue a human. The kits were donated by the Emma Zen Foundation, a pet safety organization. Emma Zen is the Labrador mix modeling the oxygen mask. Each kit comes with three mask sizes to fit different breeds. Technology has changed the workplace landscape and more employers are using technology to track what workers are doing online, on the job, and off-site. Peggy Pico takes a look at why it's legal. Your employer can legally monitor the websites you visit, your emails, texts, social media accounts, and the whereabouts of your company car even during non-work hours. Business owners say it's about productivity, but critics call it a big brother practice that robs employees of their right to privacy. Joining me on the legal issues involved is employment law attorney Dan Eaton. Dan, welcome back. Sure, nice to see you. Thank you. Dan, what do business owners say as to the need as to why they need to monitor their employees so closely? The two most frequently given reasons are productivity and misconduct. Uh, they want to squeeze as much productivity as they can out of their employees because that means higher profits. And what that means is they are trying to see where the waste is in their employee movements. With misconduct, I think it's pretty obvious why they're monitoring it if they're suspected misconduct. You shouldn't be visiting, uh, you know, sites, illegal sites or, or uh, immoral sites uh, during work hours. Exactly right. Or doing things you shouldn't be doing on the web. Even uh, using the internet casually and taking up too much time. It, it really is a time waster sometimes. What can employers in California California legally monitor? Well, uh, they can monitor anything that's out there publicly, of course, even your social media sites. What they cannot do, of course, is they cannot request or require employees or applicants to give them their social media private passwords. But it's really up to employees and applicants to monitor their privacy settings. So how about uh, cell phone text, cell, uh, phone calls, things like that? A lot of that depends on who issued the device. If it's an employer issued device and they have a policy that says they can and will monitor, they can and many times will monitor those devices. If it's private and you're using a private account and your own private uh, device, whether it's a phone or iPad or what have you, then the law is less clear about what the employer can do. If you're doing it on your own time with your own device, you're probably protected. So you mentioned that business owners are looking at this as a productivity situation, but there was a case recently in New York of a man who got fired after being monitored uh, for for uh, some of the stuff he was doing with his job. what? How can employers use this information? Can they fire you over it? Well, sure, they can, depending on the nature of it. But of course, if you're at will, there's a broad latitude to fire. But the case you're referring to is a 2008 case where the employee, in fact, uh, who was a public employee, had been disciplined for some time-wasting misconduct. The employer wanted to find out if it was still going on, so they attached a GPS to his private car. And so they found out that, yes, he was wasting time, and they fired him and a New York, an intermediate New York Court of Appeals upheld that firing, said, you know what, the employer, the public employer, in this case, ironically, the State Department of Labor had an interest in uh, its own integrity and protecting the waste of taxpayer money. But some would say, look, the government can't place a GPS on a suspect's car. They can't access your without computer. Without a court order. Right. Without a court order. They can't access your computer without a court order or a search warrant. So how come employers are given that right? Well, of course, employers in, in broad terms uh, typically don't have the constitutional restraints that apply to the government. But here in California, the constitutional right to privacy does apply both to private employers and public employers. But here's what it amounts to. If you're on notice from your employer that your employer is going to look at it, your reasonable expectation of privacy shrinks. And that allows the employer to do a lot more than he otherwise could. Let's talk about that disclosure. What do employers have to disclose and when do they have to disclose it as far as monitoring? Well, of course, depending on the situation, they may not have to disclose it at all. There was a video surveillance case that came out of the California Supreme Court that said it was okay, depending on the nature of the harm that was involved. But the bottom line is that if an employer does disclose, it gives them much more right to review and monitor this kind of behavior than if they don't. And most employers these days, Peggy, do have the kind of policies that put employees on notice 
that they can be watched. So we know before it's happening. Um, what about outside of work? Let's say you're griping about your boss on Facebook. Uh, is that something that your boss can access? Sorry, it depends. I, I know that people hate to hear that from a lawyer, but it depends on whether it's a personal gripe or whether it is a gripe that is in mutual aid and benefit of improving workplace conditions. What does that mean? The National Labor Relations Board has issued guidance that says, look, if an employee is griping in order to make workplace conditions better and is doing it in, con in conjunction with other employees, that is protected. You can't fire them for that, but if they're just personally griping, the employer can in fact take action against the employee. Your takeaway message to workers who are concerned about privacy issues at work, what's your advice? Be careful about using company issued equipment uh, and what you say on company issued equipment using company issued uh, accounts, whether social media or email, because somebody may be watching. All right, Dan Eaton, employment law attorney, thanks so much for this update. Sure, nice to see you, Peggy. It's Dining Out for Life Day, with some local restaurants donating a portion of sales to AIDS and HIV services. But one Mission Hills restaurant shows its support by helping people dine in all year long. KPBS Metro reporter uh, Taryn Minto has the story. Every weekday, Timmy Burleson spends his afternoons driving around San Diego, going from door to door with a day's dose of meals. Sometimes he also brings a carton of milk or a vase of fresh flowers, but always a smile. Special delivery. Hi. Timmy is a volunteer driver for Special Delivery San Diego. It's a meal service for those suffering with severe illnesses. Three quarters of the group's clients have AIDS or are HIV positive. But to Timmy, they're more than just clients. They're his friends. I've been doing the same route for about five years, and I've adopted these people. Like 58-year-old Gerard Hall, an HIV positive man who is also battling lung cancer. I was delighted to know that I'd have one person coming to bring the food because he doesn't mind talking for a little bit, so it means means a lot to me. The service started nearly 22 years ago by Ruth Henricks. She owns The Huddle in Mission Hills. It's a small diner that's so cozy, you can hear the kitchen refrigerators hum while sitting in the dining room. That's where Ruth first met Scott more than two decades ago. I've never seen anyone so ill in all my life. He was very thin and had dark circles under his eyes. And even though he ate a large amount of food, Ruth said he never gained any weight. And so eventually he told me that he was somebody living with AIDS. Back then, AIDS was almost a death sentence. And some days, Scott would suffer a lot. Some days, he couldn't even get up to make himself some food. He told Ruth, If I'm not here, I'm not eating. And I don't know why, out of the things that we chatted about, that particular phrase stuck in my head and in my heart. Ruth started making extra food for Scott to take home with him. But soon, he stopped coming in. Worried he wasn't eating, she asked around for his address so she could take him a meal. That's when the idea of special delivery first started. I had people coming up to me when uh, I would ask these questions about getting a meal to Scott. They would say, well, I have a neighbor who I think could benefit by a service like that. So on June 1st, 1991, the meal service was founded. But not all of Ruth's customers at the huddle were supportive. Once they found out we were feeding people with AIDS, they uh, wouldn't come in because they didn't want to catch it. But Ruth said a lot has changed since then. She now has more volunteers than she knows what to do with. And has studied nutrition to help her clients transition from sufferers to survivors. Like Timmy Burleson, the volunteer driver who actually started out as a client. HIV positive, Timmy suffered from diverticulitis, which causes thinning of the intestinal walls. He turned his health around because he paid attention to the nutritional food special delivery served him and the smile that came with it. Just looking forward to that meal and that smile every day, that interaction, was enough to make me want to get better. When he did get better, Timmy said he felt he had to be a part of special delivery. He now delivers meals five days a week with his partner. As for Ruth, she never did find Scott, but she's carried his words with her for 22 years. Taryn Mento, KPBS News. Attorneys at the California Innocence Project are planning a 600-mile walk from San Diego to Sacramento. Peggy Pico explains what's behind the long trek. 
The California Innocence Project in San Diego wants to raise awareness of wrongful convictions and get the governor to grant clemency to a dozen prisoners said to be innocent. Joining me are Jan Stiglitz, professor and co-director of the California Innocent Project, and Michael Simanchik, project attorney, who will be among those walking to the state capitol come this Saturday. Jan, the main focus of this march is to bring attention to a group of inmates dubbed the California 12. What is it about these 12 inmates that you're trying to bring attention to? Well, these are people we really believe who are innocent, but who uh, we've exhausted our ability to seek relief through the court system. So unless the governor uh, intercedes, they will spend the rest of their lives in prison for crimes they didn't do. Now, William Richards is one of those 12, and he actually was, uh, based on DNA evidence, right, his, his conviction was reversed, but he's still in prison? His conviction was initially reversed by a trial judge after we brought in DNA evidence of a stranger on the murder weapon and under the victim's fingernail, and also had a prosecution expert recant. Uh, but the California Supreme Court ultimately held that unless we affirmatively prove that Bill was innocent, even though we undermined the case against him, the conviction wasn't going to be reversed. Michael, this Innocent Project um, was also the key in last year's exoneration of football player Brian Banks. Remind us a little bit more about that case and what happened there. So Brian got, uh, he was looking at 41 years to life for uh, rape, uh, sodomy, and uh, kidnapping charges. Uh, and so he took a deal, uh, he took a, a, he pled guilty, and he spent uh, five years, two months in prison, and then was on parole for about three and a half years before he was contacted by the victim in his case uh, on Facebook. And the victim uh, contacted him and wanted to meet up. She later admitted on video uh, that she was never raped or kidnapped or sodomized. Uh, and so we worked on that case because the video alone would not have undone Brian's conviction. So we worked and investigated the case and uh, were able to come to an agreement with the district attorney to have the conviction reversed. What are some of the uh, major issues that may lead to something like this, this wrong conviction of somebody who's innocent? Is it just the uh, plea bargaining? That's just one. That's definitely a major issue, but um, some of the issues that we look for when we're screening cases are eyewitness identifications, uh, especially cross-racial identifications. Those are the worst. Uh, that's the leading cause of wrongful convictions in the United States and probably the world. Uh, we're also looking for um, arson cases because arson has changed quite a bit. Uh, shaken baby uh, cases have also, the science has changed uh, quite drastically in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, and so any, any cases where there's been an advancement in science is something that we, we'll look for. Science and technology that could actually prove, as you were saying, Jan, could actually prove the innocence. That's correct. Now, the Innocence Project gets about 1,000 inmate requests each year, and I'm sure we've all heard that, you know, a lot of inmates say, I'm innocent, or I had a bad lawyer. How many cases do you typically take on, and how do you decide which ones to take on? We do, we get about a thousand inquiries a year. We do an investigation, do some preliminary look into the case to make sure that uh, it, it meets our criteria. Ultimately, we need to decide, do we believe this person's innocent? And do we believe that there's a possibility of demonstrating that in court? If we can meet those two requirements after the investigation, we will file on a case. It seems like that would take a lot of work and a lot of time. And that's why we have students working with us on these cases, because we couldn't do it alone. Okay. And um, Michael, let's talk about this walk, 600 miles from San Diego to Sacramento. Uh, you've been training for quite some time. How long do you think it'll take? And um, why did you think it was necessary to participate in this or to have this walk? So uh, we've budgeted for 55 days. We're going to average roughly 16 miles a day. Uh, I'm actually hoping that we get there a little bit sooner. That would be great. Uh, I think it's important to have this walk because we need to raise awareness about wrongful convictions. I think there's a lot of people out there that don't know about innocence projects, think that the criminal justice system is doing its job and doing a great job, and that's just not the case. Uh, and so in addition to trying to secure the release of these 12 people, uh, we're also trying to you know, get the word out of that, that you know, criminal justice can use some reform. Okay, Michael Simanchik, good luck on that walk. And Jan Stiglitz, uh, thank you both so much for talking with us. Oceanside Theatre Company offers a world premiere, a kids' musical, and a sketch comedy in its second season. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando speaks with the company's creative team and others about how they're redefining community theatre. 
Community theater gets a bad rap and is often the butt of jokes, as in the film Waiting for Guffman. But Christopher Williams wants to challenge the notion that community theater is bad or amateur. And so I am trying to bring a professional um, work ethic, bringing in professional designers, bringing in professional actors to work with um, less experienced actors. Williams is the artistic director of the Oceanside Theater Company. Well, I've been a professional actor and director and instructor of theater for uh, almost 20 years now. Some friends and myself got together and said, you know what, we need to create a, a theater company where we live, somewhere to create, somewhere to utilize the skills that they're learning perhaps in college or at various workshops so that they have an actual stage to put their work on and experiment. I mean, this is all really an experiment for us in these first few years. Williams formed the Oceanside Theatre Company in 2011 and convinced the city to give him the Brooks Theatre as the company's home base. Now in its second season, the Oceanside Theatre is about to launch Parallel Lives. The play begins with a pair of supreme beings creating the world. Oh, oh no. Wait. She gets to have the baby. What does the male get? Ah, squat. Not a bumpkiss. It's really one scene that just kind of sets us up for a universe that's going to be a little bit wacky, maybe a little out of control. Oh! and a couple of angels creating this world that want to give us choices. I think it's a really clever way to introduce the types of topics we'll be discussing in the night, but kind of sneaky. That's what director Tracy Williams liked. She chose Parallel Lives because it had stuck with her ever since she saw it decades ago. When I saw it in New York, it came with a, like a menu, and it said, tonight's performance, you might see any of the following. It's essentially a Saturday Night Live-style sketch comedy written by Kathy Najimy and Mo Gaffney. It's a personality-driven piece, so Williams knew she had to find actresses with the right chemistry to serve up the menu items she had chosen and make them their own. It's not a traditional play where you have an arc, you have a, a conflict, a resolution, and so it's nice. Every scene needs to be its own full spectrum. And the good news is, you don't it. like a scene, there's another one There's another up. one after it, <laughs> yeah. <gonna> different. <laughs> exactly. Virginia Gregg and Jerry Lynn Brault have known each other for almost a decade and tend to finish each other's sentences. Precisely the kind of dynamic to make a two-person sketch comedy come to life. And we knew that we would play with each other. Oh, yeah. If I was going to do a choice, come along with me. Okie dokie. Let's see how it works tonight. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For the play, they tackle a combined total of 41 roles, both male and female, with few props or costumes to help define the characters. Maybe we should introduce ourselves. I don't mean to interrupt. I didn't introduce. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm wrong. Not that wrong. Most of the costume choices we have are just to help create the scene. For the most part, it's just us, our voice, and our bodies. My name is Madeline Samuels, and this is my best friend in the entire universe, 43 and a half years. My name is Sylvia Dunleavy, but please call me Sylvia. Everyone does. And they found some new nuances to those funny old ladies that made them warmer and richer and more lovable and more genuine. Hell, I got used to the microwave oven. I can get used to the idea of you being a gay person. So I ask him, are you happy, Michael? Are you careful? Okay, then. This is my new dream for you, that you have met someone and that you are happy. This is a piece that shows you how we behave and shows you how we think, but never tells you how you should. You know, we want people to come out and have a discussion. We don't want to tell people what to think. The writing, they did it very well, and it's very easy for us to transition into the serious moments that still have humor throughout. A smart approach for a young theater company trying to find its voice in the community. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Parallel Lives opens this weekend at the Brooks Theater in Oceanside. It runs through May 5th. We've got more overcast days in the forecast. Coastal temperatures will be in the upper 60s, 70s for the inland valleys with a mix of sun and clouds tomorrow. Sunny in the mountains, upper 60s and low 70s for the desert, upper 90s this weekend. When President John F. Kennedy came to San Diego State in 1963, it created a celebration along the route of his motorcade to campus, and one photo taken during the event has become famous over the years. Ken Kramer found the man who took it for tonight's story about San Diego. I want to show you a couple of things. First, this is Redford's Restaurant, El Cajon Boulevard, 2900 block between 30th and Kansas Streets. You know the place? Okay, that's one thing. 
And here is a camera that Mr. James Day bought in 1963. A 35 millimeter camera, my first 35 millimeter camera. I bought it right up the street here at Boulevard Camera, just like a block away. Now go back to that day, June the 6th, 1963. There was President Kennedy coming down El Cajon Boulevard with his motorcade. You know, way down the street, we could see Kennedy coming, waving to people. It's like, oh, this is cool. President Kennedy, I mean, he's really here. Well, he's thinking, new camera. I'd love to get a picture of Kennedy, but oh no, the president is looking the wrong way at the other side of the street. And I complained to one of my friends. I said, geez, I hope he looks over here. And, he goes, and then my friend around whip, whipped around and goes, we'll get him to look for you. And I thought, oh my God, what are these guys going to do? You know, Getting closer, going to have time for one picture. That's it. My friend started chanting loudly, Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. Not necessarily mocking, but imitating his, uh, his Harvard accent because we'd seen him on TV so much talking about Cuba. May not have been the cleverest thing in the world, but it worked. Kennedy comes by and I lean forward over the people in front of me and they're still chanting Cuba, Cuba, Cuba and focus. You know, remember this is not autofocus days, this is manual focus. So I focused the best I could, clicked off one picture and he, and he, and he was waving and then uh, went by and they were moving at a decent clip, you know, so I thought, well, either I got it or I don't. Which brings us back to Redford's here, which just happened to be right across the street from where James was trying to take his picture. And yes, it did turn out. Here it is. The president in the foreground and Redford's in the background. And so well did James and his camera work that day that the restaurant owner later ended up buying the picture and blowing it up into a mural on the outside wall of the place. Seen by countless thousands over the years now, there's his name as the photographer who just happened to have the right camera and the right crazy friends and the right exposure at the right focus at the right time to document a little history about San Diego. If you want to see more of Ken's stories about San Diego, his show can be seen tonight and every Thursday night at 8 right here on KPBS. Tonight's stories are also on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a nice night.